We're back in Daniel chapter 9. Last time we were together, we began to broach the chapter. If you understand the ninth chapter of Daniel, you shouldn't have any problem with end times prophecy. All of the previous prophecies in the book of Daniel thus far have been things that have already taken place. Now we're looking at things that are yet to come, things that will be taking place. And is it wonderful that our Father has told us all these things ahead of time? I am so thankful for his prophetic word. 30% of the Bible is prophecy. Much of that prophecy has been fulfilled, but there's a great deal of it, most significant, yet to be fulfilled. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So uh, we want to begin in chapter 9 and verse 20. This is where the uh, Daniel... Now, if you remember, how many of you uh, were here when I did the teaching on the wise men two Sundays ago? Not this last Sunday, but the previous Sunday. Okay, then you know about the wise men and that I, I do believe that they were Jews, if not full Jews, Jew, at least part Jews. And we looked at that as a result of Daniel's history in the Babylonian Empire as well as in the Medo-Persian Empire. He had great influence. He would have been one of the most influential people in the empire, in the kingdom, second only unto the king. And he was promoted to be the chief uh, magi or the chief wise men within both empires, the Babylonian and the Medo-Persian. And we know that in the Medo-Persian empire, as we studied through that, we saw that there was a great envy or jealousy that some of these, these Persian or Babylonian wise men had against Daniel. And so they plotted or schemed his demise, didn't they? And they had talked Darius into establishing a decree that no one could petition any god of any kind for 30 days except the king. And anyone who did pray to any other god or any other image was to be cast into the lion's den. And so they trapped Daniel, trapped him in knowing his fidelity, his faithfulness, his love for his god that it was his, his custom three times a day to open up his windows and pray to the east towards Jerusalem and pray to his God. And so they accused him, they found him guilty, and then he was unfortunately sentenced according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, and the king could do nothing about it because he was bound to the law as well. Don't we wish that our representative government would be bound to the law? <laughs> the lawlessness that is so pervasive today Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly, Lord. But Darius had to follow the law, and he cast Daniel into the lion's den regrettably, grievously, and then he was up all night worried while Daniel slept like a baby. <laughs> For God had shut the mouth of the lions, right? And what happened to all of those Persians who falsely accused Daniel? Yeah, they became fat cat food, right? They got thrown into, before they even hit the bottom, their bones were broke, right? They were crushed by these lions, these ferocious beasts. And so who had to replace all these men? Who would have been filling their positions? Yeah, Hebrews, Daniel would have filled them with his contemporaries, his, his countrymen, those who believed in the God of Israel as he did. And we went through the list of the the Torah that he would have and all of the prophetic books, the wise, the books of wisdom that he would already have in his possession that, that predate Daniel. So he would have had a great deal of information that he could share on the God of Israel. And that's what he did share. And so I do believe that these wise men who came from the East were of the cult of Daniel, cult being in the good sense, right? And, and that's where all of that came from. Most people don't understand that or have any understanding of that. Now, as we get into this uh, ninth chapter, God is giving Daniel such wisdom. He knows as he has studied the prophecies of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets. And Jeremiah has already foretold that there would be a judgment on Israel for 70 years. For 70 years, they will be taken out of the land. And why were they taken out of the land? Because they never gave the land its rest. And how long did they not let the land rest? 490 years, amazingly. And so God is going to give the land its rest. They owed the land 70 years. So for 70 years, they will be carried out of the land. I'm trying to determine whether there has to be a connection between those 490 years where they did not give the land its rest and the 490 years that we're going to see that Daniel has told in which God is going to be dealing with the nation of Israel now from this moment forward, you know. 
Uh, you ever see that connection? 490 years, they didn't let the land rest. Seven years of judgment. Now they're coming out of judgment, and God reveals to the angel Gabriel, to Daniel, that God has determined to work with the nation of Israel until the end of the age, or the end, the consummation of this age as we know it, for 490 years. How many sevens? 77, 77 year periods. So Daniel went up into his room, as was his custom, and he prayed to God because he wanted to know what was going to take place. He knew that the seven years was about over. And so God dispatched the angel Gabriel. How many archangels are there? Three. Three. And who was created to minister on behalf of God Almighty, the Father? Michael. Michael, the archangel. Who was created to minister on behalf of the Holy Spirit? Gabriel, the messenger angel, who was created to minister on behalf of Jesus Christ, the son? Lucifer. Lucifer. Yeah. But so Gabriel, Gabriel, who's that messenger angel, always sharing the message of God to God's people. He was the one who came to Daniel. And that's what we're seeing now. So as we pick it up in verse 20 of chapter 9. Daniel records that while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people, Israel and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Now, here he records that he's a sinner. What a, what a humble man he is, isn't he? There is nothing negative that the Bible says about Daniel whatsoever. He's one of two men of which there is no criticism whatsoever. Who's the other one? Joseph of Egypt, yeah. No criticism whatsoever. But he understands he's a sinner. Did Mary... The mother of Jesus need to be saved from her sins? Absolutely. She was a sinner as well. For all have sinned to fall short of the glory of God. Daniel confessing his sins. And you know, as you walk with the Lord longer, you realize that most of the sins you commit are not outward, but they're inward, attitudes of the heart or desires. God begins to clean us up from the inside out. And as he does, you know, some of those behaviors that we're so, we were so characteristic of before, sinful behaviors, they go by the wayside. But we still have to deal with that iniquitous. What? The iniquitous heart that we have, right? Sins, we miss the mark. Trespasses, we cross right over the line. That's deliberate. But iniquities, that's, that's what they're classified as. Sins, transgressions, and iniquity. Iniquities is a, that wicked little heart that we have, right? And God has to cleanse that. And we are fighting those temptations and the temptations of the flesh until the day we leave here. Perfection doesn't occur until we finally leave and get out of this body of sin, amen? amen. But what a humble man Daniel is. He's confessing, as he said in verse 20, his sin, my sins, and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Now he wants to know, what's going to happen with Israel? Are the people coming back? You said it would be 70 years. Are you going to reestablish the nation? Are you going to reestablish Zion as a place of worship? Yes, chapter 9, verse 21, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen at, in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. He would pray three times a day, and this is right, the, evening offer, the evening prayer, evening offering. Well, he informed me. He talked with me and he said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. We all want understanding, don't we? The number one need in the church today, you know what it is? Discernment. discernment. It is, my dear. There is such a lack of discernment in the church today. It's unbelievable. That's why so many people are led astray by so many of these false teachers and false prophets and the, the gullibility of people today, simply because they don't want to do the work of studying the Word of God and knowing the Word of God for themselves. Daniel purposed. He wanted to know. He wanted to know what God was doing and what was going to take place so he wouldn't be surprised. He wouldn't be caught off guard. So many people today, uh, I was listening to a, a fellow teaching. Yeah, he's a false teacher talking about how the best for the kingdom, for the, for the church is yet, yet lies ahead, talking about how great America is going to be, the resurgence that's going to take place within the church. There's going to be a revival from coast to coast. I don't read that in my Bible when it comes to the end times. And I do believe we're in the end times, don't you think? Yeah. Well, if we're in the end times, there's not going to be a revival. What's there going to be? 
a falling away, an apostasy. And, that, and that's precisely what we see happening. Hmm. But Daniel, Daniel wanted to know, just as we want to know, but the way in which you're going to find out is through the word of God. As Daniel seeks to know, God is going to give him a word. Verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, Gabriel says, the command went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved and beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Isn't that wonderful? The first thing that Gabriel wants him to know, he's greatly beloved of God. And so are you, aren't you? Hmm? Yeah. Greatly beloved. And we know that more than Daniel does because of the love letters that we have received in all of the New Testament. All of them expressing God's love for us and then in turn how we should love him. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us, right? Yeah. Now, I want you to know something. We understand and interpret the book of Daniel, the writings of Daniel, more accurately, more completely than did Daniel himself. Do you know that? So we must be greatly loved too, right? (laughs) So thankful for that understanding. Well... He's going to tell Daniel what God intends to do from this moment to the end of the age, to the end of this life as we know it, before God establishes his kingdom. Now, you need to understand that God always promises to Israel the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom on earth. The promises to Israel and the promises to the church are mutually exclusive. You understand that? They're not the same. What is promised the church? is a spiritual kingdom. Heaven, right? What's promised Israel is a kingdom on earth that that God is going to establish. We read that already previously. Now remember, God had given Daniel the understanding into the king's first dream. The king's first dream had to do with what? World governing empires that would come. He saw this image with a head of gold representing the Babylonian kingdom, arms and chest of silver representing the Medo Persian kingdom, a stomach and and thighs of bronze representing the Grecian kingdom, legs of iron, feet partly iron, partly clay representing Rome. So he sees all of these world governing empires that are going to come about right up until the time of the end. And as Daniel gives the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 and verse 44, he says, now in the days of these kings, those, the final kings, the, the legs of iron, feet partly iron, partly clay, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will what? Turn to chapter 2, verse 44, and somebody read that to me nice and loud. Nice and loud, I said. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break And ever, and ever, and ever, as Billy Graham would say, and ever, and ever. <laughs> and that's precisely what God is sharing with Daniel is what's going to take place right up until the time where God establishes his kingdom on earth. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. So as Daniel is interpreting the king's dream, he understands what it was. Then there was this vision that it occurred of these beasts, remember? A beast like a bear, a lion with wings, a bear up on its side with ribs in its mouth, a leopard. And then there was a beast that couldn't be described. It was ferocious. It was terrible. And and those represented what? The same thing. Those four kingdoms. But that last empire was described in more detail. It was terrifying. It was like nothing you'd ever see on earth in the way it was destroying and devouring And then Daniel himself, remember Daniel himself started to describe some of the dreams he was having. And in chapter 7, he describes a dream and he sees these animals and he sees these these empires rising up. But then he gives us a little more detail about this little horn that rises up out of the beast. And what did that little horn represent? The Antichrist. Now, listen, it's not that he's against Christ, he's a pseudo-Christ. He claims to be Christ and he's not. 
And then in chapter 8, Daniel gives us even more understanding of this little horn who speaks such blasphemous words. He's so arrogant, so audacious, so prideful, and he speaks against the God of God, the God of heaven. And that is consistent throughout the scriptures now in what we read of this man of sin and his arrogance, his pride. Him speaking so blasphemous against the God of God's. If you're ever in my home or if you're ever around my dog Snickers, all you have to say is blasphemer and he will go crazy. You know, <laughs> I've taught him that he needs to be ferocious and attack blasphemers. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> but, but, but the world is becoming so anti-Christ, isn't it? The hatred, for, we talked on Sunday about the hatred that would take place. If they hated me, Jesus said, they're going to hate you. If they won't receive my word, they're not going to receive your words. And we see how the hatred has grown in our society towards the church, towards Jesus Christ, and towards true Christians, the body of Christ. <clears throat> so nonetheless, uh, God is going to give Daniel the understanding of what is going to take place next, how this is going to come about right up into the, the kingdom being established here on earth, the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom that David will co-reign with Christ in. So he says in verse 24, and, and when did Daniel receive this vision about, remember? Yeah, it's about 539 B.C., but here he says in verse 24, he says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. So that's just a little under two years. Is that what that is? 70 weeks? A little under two years? No, come on. Time and time and time again, the, the scriptures are determining or, or reveal to us this period of time. It talks about the 70 weeks. It talks about the 70th seven. It talks about the 70th seven being, being uh, three and a half weeks, right? Time, times, half a time. It talks about it being 1,260 days. It talks about it being 42 months. So this is a very specific period of time when we understand what it means by the, the interpretation of weeks. This word weeks is really representative of the Hebrew word heptad, which is a seven-year period. So these are 70 seven-year periods, which can, would comprise how many years? 490 years. So what the, the angel is giving Daniel an understanding of is that from right now, Daniel, until the end of the, the end of time as we know it here, there's going to be 70 seven-year periods in which God is dealing directly with the church, with Israel. You, you must understand that the two major subjects of the Bible, number one, Jesus, the Messiah. Number two, Jesus. Israel, Israel. Do you know, uh, I was having a conversation with someone the other day who comes from a, a Lutheran background, more of a reformer covenant background, and, and what was the major denomination that embraced covenant theology that brought about passive and aggressive anti-Semitism? Catholicism. Then Luther. Luther was a Catholic priest. Mm, yeah. Luther never denounced his Catholicism. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church, but he never denounced the Catholic Church. And, and Luther was a terrible anti-Semite, wasn't he? Anti-Semitism in Luther is well documented. Why? Because he said an unconverted Jew is only good for the fire, for the flames. He said an unconverted Jew should be burned. Ooh, that's pretty serious, isn't it? I don't think he had a very good grasp of the Israelology of Scripture. <laughs> and unfortunately, that is true today. Um, when I first got saved, I left the Catholic Church because th there was a serious misunderstanding of the Scriptures from what I understood. And I started going to a Dutch Reformed Church. Well, as I went to the Dutch Reformed Church and, and I was learning about their particular hermeneutical bias in covenantal theology, the replacement theology was so prevalent. You know what replacement theology is? That the church has replaced Israel. Is that true? 
No, the promises to each are very mutually exclusive. They're not the same. The church has promised a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom in heaven. Israel has promised a physical kingdom. God has made promises, unilateral promises to Israel that he will keep. And if he doesn't keep those promises, then we can't trust him either. You understand that? Yeah. But unfortunately, more and more and more Christians in the United States have no understanding of the Israelology of the Bible, the, 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 the prominence, the place of importance that Israel has in the scriptures. It's amazing to me how ignorant the church is today. Uh, three weeks ago, I taught on where Jesus was actually born. Where was he born? Some of you know. The Migdal Edar, the Migdal Edar, right? That's the place, actual place where Jesus was born. And it was where? Bethlehem? <laughs> Bethlehem Ephrathah. <laughs> not, not old little town of Bethlehem, right? But Bethlehem Ephrathah, what's the difference between the town of Bethlehem and Bethlehem Ephrathah? <laughs> she says, it sounds like you're throwing up every time you say that. <laughs> It's the agricultural zone, right? Yeah, it's that area where, where and what does Ephrathah mean? Agriculture. Fruitful. It means fruitful, fruitful. So that's, that's the area that Jesus came from. It was the ancestral homeland of David the king that he gave to the priests of Israel. For what purpose? To, birth and raise. to raise the lambs that would be given for sacrifice to God at the temple. All of those shepherds that would shepherd their sheep outside the town of Bethlehem in Bethlehem Ephrathah were Levitical shepherds. They were under rabbinical rule and law because they were raising these shepherds for the sacrifice to God, Hashem. And it's no coincidence that the Lamb of God was born where those very shepherds were raised and birthed there at the Migdal Edar. And when, as soon as those lambs were born, what did those shepherds have to do? Wrap them in swaddling cloths, right? And, and so when the angel said to the shepherds, and this shall be a sign to you, to you, they knew exactly this sign was for us specifically. Nobody else would understand this sign, but you'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a man. They knew exactly where in the manger. There was only one manger in the tower of the flock for those lambs that would be born and given to God. And then the priest would come in and examine those immediately after birth to make sure there were no birth defects or there were no blemishes that didn't get damaged or hurt or injured in any way during the birth process. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? Hmm. Why did I go there, Larry? <laughs> but it was good. It was good. <laughs> 70 weeks, that's why, 70 weeks. And so what is being revealed here is there is a 490-year period in which God is dealing directly with Israel. Israel, not the church, Israel, not the body of Christ, Israel, until the time of the end of the age as we know it, the end of time. Everybody wants to know, when, when is the end of the world? When is the end of time as we know it? Well, Daniel is given the, the key. There's 70, seven-year periods in which God is dealing directly with Israel. For what purpose? For your people. Who's Daniel's people? The Jews. And for your holy city. Where's the holy city? Rome. No, it's not Rome. It's not. No, it's the holy city? Jerusalem. You ask any Catholic where the holy city is, and what are they going to tell you? <laughs> yeah, Luther, Luther had some choice words about the city of Rome, didn't he? And the popes. <laughs> But no, this 70-week period specifically, specific, specifically is for the Jew and, and for Jerusalem, for Israel. What's the purpose? Well, the first three things, it's going to take place with God dealing with, the, with Israel and the coming of the Messiah is first to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sin and reconciliation for iniquity. God wants to forgive us of our sins. God doesn't want to judge us for our sins. Judgment is the last thing God wants to do. He'll judge if he has to when people harden their hearts towards him. But God's chief attribute is what? Love. The hased of God. That, that word, the Hebrew word hased, the loving kindness of God, that fatherly love of God, that, that, that love that forgives, that love that shows grace and mercy, that love that restores. And, and you know, there's nothing more, more powerful in restoring relationships than forgiveness. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, reconciliation takes uh, the forgiveness of the one offended and accepting that forgiveness by the one who made the offense, okay? And then you can have a reconciliation. And so that's what God was doing. He provided that propitiation. Propitiation is the appeasing sacrifice for the offended power. We offend God. Do we offend God by what we do or do you offend God by who we are? That's who we are. Now, now we sin because we're sinners, because that's who we are. And my life is an offense to God. But I need to come to God, surrender my life, acknowledge my sins as Daniel has, surrender to him, and allow him to come into my life and to transform me from the inside out. And when I receive his forgiveness and the way of reconciliation, there's only one way, only one way, People will say, well, you know, all, all roads lead to God. All rivers lead to the ocean. All roads lead to God. Well, everybody's going to meet God eventually, aren't they? But there's only one way in to the kingdom, and that's through Jesus. There's but one way, right? And so God did the first three things here in this list here in, in verse 24 have been accomplished at the first coming of Jesus. And we read that, if you, if you go, we're not going to do that tonight because we don't have time, but if you went to Luke chapter 4 and you read verses 16 through 21, you'd see that's precisely what Jesus did in fulfilling these three purposes and missions of the Messiah. Now, the second part of that in verse 24, he says, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, I don't see everlasting righteousness from shore to shore here, do you? I don't see everlasting righteousness throughout the globe, do you? Every day and in every way, the world seems to be getting worse, not better. It is. It's getting, I mean, when we think it's gotten as bad as it could possibly get, oh boy, then we hear some other craziness. You see that 15-year-old girl in Houston got shot 22 times walking her dog? Just, just senseless violence. Animals filled with, with demonic influence. A 15-year-old girl walking her dog like she did every night, every night. And this car pulls up, and then they shot 22 times. They shot that poor girl. Well, thank God she died quickly. She didn't suffer. But listen, the violence in our nation today, the violence among our people, it's, it's, it's demonic. There's always been violence. Who killed Abel? Cain, right from the beginning. But who's the chief murderer behind every murder? Satan. 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 And, and so we, we've seen violence, but, but violence has, has come to an, a supernatural degree. As in the days of Noah. Noah, the days of Noah was marked by a, a demonic violence. Men against men. And that's what we're seeing today. It's horrible, horrible. Yes, everlasting righteousness is coming in. It's, and it's coming, beloved. Every, every wound will be healed. Every wrong will be made right. When he establishes his kingdom very soon, you're never going to have another concerning thought ever, ever. And not a worrisome thought, not an anxious thought. Can you, can you believe that? I'm a worrier. I don't know about you. I'm a worrier. You know, I worry about things, you know. Now, I give it to the Lord. Uh, you know, eventually we have to give it to the Lord. But, you know, I, so often I pick it up again, give it away. You pick it up again. You know, but you don't do that, do you? No, you don't do that. No, no, no. No. He'll bring in everlasting righteousness. He'll seal up vision and prophecy. That all of the visions that the prophets have received, all of the prophecies that have been shared and given, uh, the apocalyptic literature of all of the New Testament, uh, John's apocalyptic vision, all of that will be fulfilled. Has that taken place yet? No, some of the most important prophecies or visions that God gave his people, his servants to give to us, the church, are yet to be fulfilled. So we see that righteousness hasn't come, prophecy hasn't been fulfilled, and to anoint the most holy. Who's the most holy? Jesus, Jesus. Now, how is it that he's going to be anointed? Yes, made king of the world as he sits upon the throne in Jerusalem. He, he's taken possession of that which is rightfully his and taking the title deed to the earth. We see that in the Revelation in John's vision, right? He sees a scroll with seven seals that represents the title deed of the earth. Who is worthy? What, what happened? Who forfeited the deed of the earth? Adam did. To whom? Satan. 
Now, Jesus purchased it back by his blood, by his sacrifice. And, and so we see in heaven where he comes forward as a lamb who had been slain, who is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, to fulfill all of God's will and purposes. Intense. And then at the end of all of that, he sits on his throne in Jerusalem as king of the world, king of kings and lord of lords. Isn't that wonderful? That's what it means to anoint the most. Now, that's all yet to take place, isn't it? Bring in everlasting righteousness, fulfill all prophecies and visions, and, and anoint Jesus as king of the world. But he goes on to say, no, verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. How many weeks is that? 69 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Now, in, in that, that uh, seven-week period, how many years is that? Forty-nine years. What happened during that time? The wall got rebuilt, and the city, yeah. And, and so he's talking about the 49, and then the 62, and the, uh, uh, let me read it again, 7 and the 62, right? The seven weeks, 7 times 7 is 49, and then the 62 weeks, a total of 69 seven-year periods, 69 times 7, yeah, 483 years. Four, that's it, 483 Okay, so now he's saying that, that from the time the command is given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the prince, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the king of Israel, there shall be seven weeks, 62 weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Did that happen? Luke chapter 19 records for us what? What do we call that? The what entry? The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. If you went for, back in time, 483 years, oh, wait a minute, now what kind of a calendar did they use, the Jewish boys there? 360-day calendar. It was a 360-day year. So you do the math, 483 years times 360 days, it's how many days? 173,880 days from the time the commandment is given to store and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, Jesus. That command was given by Artaxerxes. It's recorded for us in Nehemiah chapter 2. It was given in 444 B.C. The command was given when, when Daniel brings Cyrus, the king, the scroll of Isaiah, says, hey, you're going to let the people go. He let the people go. And then the command was going, go back and rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, and you have the king's permission. And you'll have the king's permission. And you'll have the king's protection. Now go. How many went back? Less than 50,000 Jews went back. That was, a fra that was just a fraction of those who were there in Persia, which was formerly Babylon. Why did they not go back? Business was good. They were getting very wealthy, very rich. They were very influential as a result of Daniel and his friends and his amigos becoming the wise men of the kingdom. Wow. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is what take, took place. So the command was given, recorded for us in Nehemiah, 444 B.C. I think it was March 14th, 444 B.C. So that's what uh, Sir Robert Anderson, an English scholar and theologian, wrote a book. And what did he call the book? And to the coming of the prince. It's called the coming prince. And to the coming of the Messiah. He wrote a book called The Coming Prince. He records all of this. And so if from that moment on, from the time the decree was given, if you go forward in time, 173,880 days, or 483 years, comprised of 360 days each year, you come to April 33 AD, Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem as recorded for us in Luke's gospel, chapter 19. And Jesus holds all the Jews responsible to know the time of his coming, just as those wise men from the cult of Daniel knew the Messiah's birth. Wasn't that amazing? And how far did they travel? Almost a thousand miles. 
almost 1,000 miles, somewhere, somewhere in 800 miles. It took them months. It was a mo- probably a four- to five-month journey, very dangerous, a lot of a sacrifice, very uncomfortable at times, and yet they purposed to do that to try to discover who it was, the king of the Jews, who was born. And they lose, lose sight of the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God, for a little while, and they end up where? King Herod's palace. Oh, that's the last place they really want to be, wasn't it? Very dangerous for them. You know, if you haven't listened to that message, go back and listen to that. A lot of information I give out. It's all so fascinating. But but then Herod said, where? Where would the Messiah be born? And they came to him and they said, oh, as recorded by Micah, the prophet, he would be born where? Bethlehem Ephrathah. Now, these religionists knew exactly what the Bible said. They knew exactly what the prophecy said. And how far were they from Bethlehem? Six miles. And they wouldn't go six miles. Is that not amazing to you? People who won't get off their duff won't take a minute and, and, and look into these things, these treasures, these pearls of wisdom that God would give us from his word. But, oh, but the religionists... And you listen to some of the garbage that they espouse. But they don't know Jesus. They don't know him in heart. Herod wanted to kill the Christ child. These religionists were apathetic. They, they knew the scripture. They didn't believe it. It wasn't in their heart. Like a lot of people today, professional clergy. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're professionals. But it's not in their heart. There's no passion for God. But these wise men, wise women, Still seek him, don't they? Yeah. We'll give everything to know more and more. Yeah. Like my friend said tonight, I just want to know more. I want to know more. I want to know more about Jesus. I want all I can learn, right? Mm. So the command was given, and Jesus comes exactly when Daniel had prophesied he would come. And he says to Israel, if you knew this, thy day, that what? Makes for your shalom. Listen, today, today, the invitation is made to you to have peace with God. Come, come and make peace with God by confessing your sins, by acknowledging I'm the sacrifice for your sins and allowing the Holy Spirit to enter into your heart. How many people need peace today? 50% of the prescriptions filled today at CBS and Walgreens and Walmart Farm, you know what they're for? Psychotropic drugs. You know why? Huh? Just to try Trying to find peace. And if they're not doing it through prescription drugs, then they're doing it through the mo- What's the most abused drug in the world? Alcohol. Alcohol. We went out to dinner last night, and, and, and there was a fine restaurant, a beautiful place. We were invited by a friend. I prayed. He paid. You know, <laughs> it was expensive, but, but, but we, we weren't sitting far from the bar. Were we? Oh, my goodness. All these people had no peace. No peace. And if it's not prescription drugs, if it's not alcohol, then it's, it's street drugs, isn't it? And then we look at the epidemic of suicide today. And with the lockdown, you know, drugs and alcohol, use went crazy. Isn't that amazing? What else went crazy during the lockdown? What? Suicide, domestic violence. You have a time to be together, to cozy up with one another, right? <laughs> oh, but that's not what happened. They beat up on one another. Get drunk. Get hot. Oh, my, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. If you had known Israel, the things that make for your peace, and now they have been hidden from your eyes. The national rejection of Jesus by Israel caused God to turn from Israel, give them their way. We're reading that in John's gospel as we come to the end of the 12th chapter. What ended? The public ministry of Jesus to Israel ended because they kept rejecting him. And eventually, you know, you can say no so often that finally God says, fine, I won't call anymore. Your will be done. But chapter 13 began such a glorious period of ministry for his disciples, for his apostles, It was the private ministry of Jesus to those whom he greatly loves. Daniel, greatly beloved. Hey, listen to me. Listen to me. 
we, we have many, many, many problems in our nation. But the number one problem is our godlessness. The number one problem is we turn from God. We were one nation under God. No more. No more. And I personally believe, and I, you, can, you can, if you would like to sit down and, sh- and share your position, I'd be glad to hear it. We can do it over breakfast or lunch. And again, you pay, I pray. Uh, <laughs> but, but the point being, I do believe that the public ministry of Jesus to this nation is over. The, 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 the evidence is overwhelming. But the private ministry of Jesus to the body of Christ, I'm not talking about Christendom, the body of Christ. The, the private ministry of Jesus to the body of Christ is glorious, it's wonderful. And you know what I'm talking about. We know, we, he's given us eyes to see, ears to hear, he's coming, he's coming. Well, just, just as Daniel prophesied, it occurred. Yet, there was only a handful of Jews that understood the significance of what had happened that day. There's, listen, there's only a handful of people who call themselves Christian today who really understand the significance of what is happening in our day. After the six, verse 26, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with a flood till the end of the war of desolations are determined. What's, what, what's happened here? Who are the, who are the, who's the prince of the people to come? Hmm? The Romans. Now, now, the prince behind the Roman Empire is the one yet to come, that, that man of sin, the son of perdition, that little horn, that pompous, big mouth, right? He's yet to take, he's yet to come. But what happened was Jesus was cut off. The Messiah was cut off. Why? Not for himself, but for us. What happened to him? He was crucified. No one takes my life. The Lamb of God laid it down willfully. And when we talk about the Akadah, Right? And now, again, again, if you have a Jewish perspective on the Bible, when you come to that story of Abraham and Isaac, you understand the Jews put the emphasis where it should be placed. In Western culture, whenever you hear a message on the binding of Isaac and, and the attempted sacrifice of Isaac before God, as Abraham brings him up to Mount Moriah, the very place where Jesus would be crucified, and, and the emphasis is always on Abraham sacrificing his son, right? Right? But from the Jewish standpoint, they call it the Akadah. What does that mean? Binding. The binding. That, that Isaac was a man. He could have easily overpowered Abraham. Isaac laid down his life willingly. Wow. What a type of Christ, right? Jesus, the prince who came and was cut off, but not for himself. He came to die. He came the first time so he would... Come again. <laughs> yeah. Now, verse 27, very, very key. And next week, I'm going to spend the whole hour on verse 27. It's already 8 o'clock. But listen to me. This, have you ever heard of the gap theory with regard to the creation story? Yeah. That's not true. But there's a gap here. There's a gap between verse 26 and verse 27. How long is the gap? 2,000 years, the church age. Right. So from the end of the 69th seven to the beginning of the 70th seven, there's a period of 2,000 years. And that's what we call the church age, the church age. And when the church age is over, and we're going to talk about this at length next week, when the church age is over, and that's about to happen very soon, then the 70th seven of Daniel starts to tick off. Then the world only has seven years left. And then the Messiah is going to come and establish the kingdom of Israel on earth. Glorious, glorious. Now, next week, uh, start to look into the prophecies concerning this 70th seven of Daniel. I want you to come back and share with me what you've discovered, okay? What's important about this period of time? Where do you find this, this period of time mentioned? The last three and a half years of this seven years is called what? The Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. 
It's called the 42 months in portions of Scripture. It's called the 1,260 days in Scripture. It's called the time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. Or it's stated three and a half years specifically. But this period of time is mentioned over and over and over again. Think it's important? You think you should know something about that? Now listen, listen, just as Jesus held the Jews responsible that they should have had the knowledge of his first coming. He's holding the church responsible to have the knowledge of his second coming and Israel. Very important. You know the parable of the five wives and the five... Yeah. Yeah. So we should not be sleeping, but we should have our eyes open. Jesus said in Luke 21, pray always. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you will be found worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. He was talking about his coming and he would come for most, they'd be completely unaware. Just like Israel of old. Completely unaware of his coming. When he says watch ye therefore, you know what that means. What does it mean? You sleep with one eye open, right? Yeah. All of Herod's wives, they had to sleep with one eye open. <laughs> Watch ye therefore, sleep with one eye open, pray always. What does that word pray mean? Beg. Beseech the Lord. Beg him. What? That you would be found worthy to escape. Indicative of that is what? That you may not be found worthy. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Now, who was Jesus talking to at the time in Luke 21? The apostles. But it wasn't for them. They were not going to see that period of time. Who's that warning to? Us. Us. Hey, 2022. Take your relationship with serious, uh, with your relationship with Jesus and his word more serious than you ever have before in your life. This may very well be the year. Things are coming together so rapidly, and, and you know that, that we're warned that when these things begin to take place, John tells us in the Revelation that they will happen quickly. Now, that word quickly is not chronos. It doesn't mean in time. It's the word tachos. What's, what's tachos? Like a tachometer. What's a tachometer? Vroom, vroom. You rev up the engine. You let it go, right? <laughs> It'll happen so quickly, so rapidly, so fast people won't have time to get their breath. One thing will happen, then another, and another, and another, and another, and, and it'll, be, it'll bewilder most people, but you, that, will, that, they will, that they will not take you unaware. We'll see it begin to happen, and we'll look to the eastern sky for our redemption. Hallelujah. Praise God. Be informed. Don't be slumbering and sleeping. Be aware. Be awake. Get into the word of God more than you ever have before, but most importantly, get into the life of Jesus and let Jesus live his life through yours. No game playing. There's enough people playing games with God and they're going to be very, very disappointed. You cannot presume upon the grace of our God and get away with it. No, 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 no. Amen? Amen. Amen. Terry, you got a closing song? Shall we stand? <laughs>